Welcome to the Student Success Podcast. I'm Al Solano, founder of the Continuous Learning Institute, or CLI, a higher education online resource focused on providing community college and open access university educators with practical information on how to get results at their campus. As a resource within CLI, the Student Success Podcast is focused on just that, the challenges, opportunities, failures, and successes of practices intended to improve student success and equity. The goal is to leave you with thought-provoking ideas, not some bolts information, and or lessons learned from the field so you can consider how you might apply them to your institutional context. For today's podcast, it's a pleasure to have Diego Navarro, Professor Emeritus at Cabrillo College and founder of the Academy for College Excellence. His work has been featured on PBS. His research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, Gates Foundation, and other nationally known foundations. In addition, the Community College Research Center conducted a comprehensive research study on his evidence-based practices to improve student success and equity. Welcome to the Student Success Podcast, Diego. Thank you, Al. Good to see you. It's great to be with you. I'm so excited to have you. One of the things that I like to ask guests, can you tell us something about yourself beyond your work? Anything, uh, any hobbies that you have, anything that you like to share? Well, I, I don't know if this is a hobby, but back when I was in college in the 70s, I didn't have a car, so I used to hitchhike. And um and two things would happen when I would hitchhike. One would be I'd have to have a change in direction. And I think a lot of this plays itself out in development of the work I'm, I've been doing. Um, but you have to change direction at times. You know, I was hitchhiking north at one point and cars weren't going up Highway 1 up in Marin. So I turned around and went south and ended up and had a great time. But I had to go to a different direction. And the other thing is, you know, you, you get frustrated at times. You're wondering if things are going to work out. And some sign comes to you that, oh, things are moving forward. I remember this one time in Ohio, I was hitchhiking, you know, to Indiana on my way back home to California. And um, I was underneath this bridge and I was like, am I ever going to get picked up? You know, these trucks are driving by. And then this butterfly sort of flies across and I see it. And it's like, oh yeah, things are okay, you know? And I got picked up and made it all the way back to California. So, you know, these signs and changing direction is just part of some of the things you need to do when you're trying to innovate. So you hitch the 70s, at the time when kids can go in cars without seatbelts. Parents told you, just go outside and play. Very, very different time. So you hitchhike. So how how far did you hitchhike? A um, number of times. I mean, I went from L.A. to British Columbia and then back down to San Francisco. I hitchhiked, you know, from Ohio all the way out. Well, actually from different parts of, of um, the Midwest to Ohio, then out to Colorado and then back to California, just you know, our local things. I used to hitchhike all the time from Wren County to um, to Berkeley, you know, over the Richmond Bridge. So that was a regular thing. Or I'd hitchhike from northern Wren County to southern Wren County to San Francisco, where I was working for the American Friends Service Committee doing um, community organizing on bank, not stop banking on apartheid back in 78. You know, so hitchhiking was just a part of getting around. That's fascinating. Obviously, we, we can't be recommending that these days. So it's just fascinating that, that you did there. I'm going to find a way to fold that in into our conversation uh, about your, your good work, Diego. So tell us a, a little bit about your, your background, because I know that that had such a significant impact on your approach and how you help disproportionately impacted students? I guess it started with, um, you know, I was born in East L.A. General Hospital, and the reason for that was my mother spoke Spanish as well as English, but um, she wanted a doctor that spoke Spanish. So I was born in that hospital, and I grew up in a place called Pomona, and most um, college-bound people know Pomona College, but that's actually from the Claremont Colleges. I was on, we lived on the other side of the tracks in Pomona, um, my grandparents came to this country in the 19, late 1919, right after World War I, and they only spoke Spanish, and they lived in this country until they died in their 1960s and 1970s, only speaking Spanish. My parents grew up, Spanish being their first language, but then they were discriminated against in school. So they had, there was this like, I mean, we grew up in Southern California, I grew up in Southern California, so there was this talk that the family would give you about, you know, you're going to be perceived as someone 
that um, isn't competent, working with your hands. And, and indeed, I was put into wood shop and metal shop and electric shop when I went from elementary school where I did fine in math and English. But they put me in metal shop and these shop classes, you know, because my name preceded me. And um, then I went through my mother dying when I was in ninth grade, you know, right before I went into high school. And it was bone cancer back in 72. So there was no pain control. You know, there wasn't hospice services. So that was an absolute trauma. Um, having, you know, feeling like you couldn't do anything when she was, you know, in so much pain in the middle of the night. Um, so that led for me, I just spun out in high school, you know, and I didn't really um, track high school much at all, but I graduated from high school, um, did sports that kind of kept me out of trouble. Well, but I was in trouble too, you know, so it's like being raised in Pomona, which is a pretty violent place. We had the Crips and the Bloods. It was like South Central LA. And um, I was out on the streets a lot after my mom died because my father wasn't around a lot. So, you know, I, I knew what it was like to graduate from high school and not be prepared for college. And I couldn't read and write at college level. But luckily, my father moved to Pasadena. My senior year of high school, I stayed in Pomona with a family. And then I went to Pasadena City College because my father, I moved out to Pasadena. And um, luckily, there wasn't developmental education, you know, in the 70s. I just signed up for English 1A, you know, and I had to really study a lot and make it happen, which they're now finding, you know, don't put these students that are not prepared for college into developmental English. But that was that was after my times, thank God. Um, so I pulled myself through. And so I, I find that, you know, one of the big tragedies we have right now is just a waste of human resources, a, a waste of human resources. And also that, we need different perspectives. You know, I finally, I, you know, I, when I went to graduate school, you know, I went to one of the best ones in the country, you know, Ivy League College. And I was in a section with all these students for the whole year. And, um, you know, they, it was like these people had silver spoons in their mouth. You know, they lived a totally different life than me. And, you know, I came from community college. You know, they came from, you know, the best schools in the East Coast, both prep schools as well as, you know, the Ivy League schools. So they had a whole nother perspective. And when they would share their values in class, like, you know, I was, I was at Harvard Business School. So they were asking us, we went and took a course on human resource management, you know, and they're showing us the first movie was um, the mining movie, you know, that showed the coal mines in Virginia. And, um, and I just, the things that the students would say in the class, you know, about these workers. And I, you know, my family was union workers, you know, my grandfather worked in the mines and worked in the steel mills in Gary, Indiana. My other grandfather worked in the steel mills in Fontana. You know, my dad was in union. Every, you know, so it was like a totally different perspective. And I feel like, you know, we need students that come from backgrounds that are not from the elite, you know, that come from real experience of suffering in their neighborhoods that happen, you know, having to deal with adversity and so many different levels, you know, of financial, you know, constraints that create, you know, anxiety in the family through, you know, walking to school and having violence around you. The, the, this perspective needs to be involved in our policymaking and in the management of our country. And so the hope I have is that the work we do has these students transition. You know, I have students that have gone to law school. I have students, you know, that, that are the president of the student um, government at Cabrillo College for many years. I have a number of students coming out of my program and all of them were underprepared for college and many came from very colorful backgrounds. So tell us about, given the experience that you've had, the, the trauma that it is that so many people live, live through, and then they're all of a sudden in an academic setting. Can you unpack the work that you've done to help these students? So let me tell you the story about this first student group I worked with. So I, I'm used to doing action research, which means that you you pull together your best ideas and pull together a team and you do something and then you study to see how it worked. And um, so our first pilot, I did five pilots in the development of the program. This is back in 2002. And Sue Nurton, who is my buddy, she's a really great computer science teacher at Cabrillo College. And um, she and I just went off and pulled together, started doing um, tutoring at the the um, youth build program in Watsonville. So Watsonville is 80% Latino. Um, and that's where I started the program. And we were doing um, math tutoring because we wanted to see how these students react, you know, how they were dealing with math and, and youth build, you know, took ex gang members and students that dropped out of high school, um, students that were on the edge, um, welfare to work and other areas. And they gave every other week, they would be um, working on a job site, learning um, construction skills to become an apprentice carpenter in a union. And then the other week they were getting their GEDs. So we would meet with them and do math tutoring with them. 
we and so we I asked the program director Tamara. She's really great. And Tamara said, "Yeah, you could have these students for a week." So I had them for a week. And the first day they came to the campus, this is Watsonville campus, brand new campus, was built like a year before. So we're Sue and I and our our other colleagues from the computer science department are are sitting in the classroom waiting for the students to come in. It's supposed to start at nine, and you know it's nine fifteen after nine. Only one student was in the class. He was uh, an ex boxer, so he was actually a student that was learning how to box, and he was very disciplined. Um, but none of the other students showed up, and then about twenty after they started coming in, you know, as a group. And I was going, what's going on here? And, um, and then later that morning, a cop looked in the window. So there's like a windows on the, on the doors. And I thought, what's, what's happening here. And so then during a break, I asked the students, you know, what went on this morning? They said, well, you know, we were sitting in the parking lot, you know, this is between the spring semester and the summer session. So there was nobody on campus. So there was at that time when we were doing the pilot and they were sitting in their car for the students and, um, and I didn't know it at the time, but our campus was in the, the Norteño district. Norteños and Soreños are the two gangs in, in, in California, or two of the, the, um, the Latino gangs. And so um, they were sitting in their car. A guy came by and kicked the car. They got out and got into a scuffle because they were from Soreño neighborhood, but they were in a car now parked in a Norteño neighborhood. And they get out of the car. There's a scuffle. The students are like, you know, the, the guy runs. And so they're now they're heading up to the class. You know, this, this is a day in the life of students, you know, and they're up in the elevator and student, um, he feels weird. He puts his hand in his, in his side and pulls it out. He has blood on his hand. He got sliced in the, in the altercation, you know. And um, so he went off and, you know, he got eight stitches and came back to class. So one thing that I started to notice, you know, from the very beginning is that our students are dealing with a reality that many of us don't even know about and that are not aware of that affects their lives. Um, you know, that what I've found is that we have to learn how to create gravity because our students have lives before they make the transition well that have centripetal force. It's pulling them away from college. They have responsibilities to their family. They have patterns of how they socialize and want to have fun with their friends. You know, they, they don't do homework, you know, a lot of the times because they didn't have to do it in high school. You know, there's these other things, responsibilities to the family. There's other things that pull them away. So how do you create gravity so that the students stick to your program? And that's, that's like one of the key things I found. The second key thing I found, which I think is the root issue besides the centripetal force, is that these students have a strength and persistence and a strength and survival. And I remember my first few pilots, and I did five of them. You know, these are five 40-hour pilots, did them over a year and a half before I started the program, where I looked at 36 different curriculum and narrowed it down to nine and piloted these nine to see what would actually work um, to help create the sense of belonging and a sense of um, psychological safety. Now, these terms are being used today. Back in 2002, there was no one talking about this. All I was looking at was self-efficacy, because that's the only thing that was really talked about for adults at that time. So what we did was, um, I just found that focusing on the students' well-being and their connection to each other and into, to you, that you were able to really help them adapt to the academic environment. What I mean by that is that I feel that our key role is to help these students take their strengths and persistence and survival. Because, you know, they've gone through stuff that you wouldn't want your children to go through. They've gone through all kinds of things in their lives, and they're still there. They're at your college. They're wanting to do something different in their life. Some of them are changing a trajectory of generational movement in their family. It's huge stuff they're carrying on their shoulders. Well, our role is, is to help these students that have a strength and persistence and survival, you know, because they've made it through all kinds of stuff and they're in your classroom. What we have to do is help them take that strength and apply it to the academic environment. And it's not a reading issue. It's not a writing issue. It's not a math issue. It's an issue about how do you help them have a sense of dignity and how do you create a space that's safe for them so they can let their hair down? And so the work that I've been doing recently is working with colleges to help them understand how do you create a culture of dignity? 
because dignity is the absolute key to all this. And what I found that the word dignity came to me a number of years ago as I was, it was, wasn't when I was doing my work. It was actually my, it was with my father and it was right before, like two years before he had to move out of his house because he was having dementia problems. He was losing his memory. So he was like 88 years old at the time and he started losing his memory. And I would notice that he, he would, he would get flustered and also he'd get embarrassed and felt shame. And I realized at that point that for me to be with my father, I had to create dignity in my relationship with him at any point because for him to feel shame was the wrong thing to happen with me and in, in our relationship. And he was a wonderful person. He went through a lot in his life and he helped me and I needed to create dignity for him. And that's when I started to realize that was the word that I'd been searching for that I'd been doing from the beginning of the program is how do you create a culture of dignity? Because these students have a stress response system. Now, I was a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching when I was doing my sabbatical. And I was doing a lot of research when I was there. And there are several findings. But one of the key findings is students have a stress response system that gets triggered. And it gets triggered in an environment where they don't feel safe. And what happens is that faculty don't even know that they're doing something that's actually causing that stress response system to kick in. And the real issue is, is that we don't understand learning and physiology because in the brain there's an amygdala and that amygdala is very sensitive. It's developed over evolutionary time to, to, to see threat and then to respond. And when it so sees threat and it's in 15 milliseconds, it kicks in and it goes into a fight, flight, freeze and appease pattern inside of your body and you can't control it. It ab absolutely happens. Now, if you have a window of tolerance that's not too broad, and that's a whole other concept that comes out of research out of UCLA, um, the work that Daniel Siegel does. Um, he's a, he's a um, researcher at the UCLA Medical School. They do prefrontal lobe research, which is the key. You know, the prefrontal lobe is where agency and, and um, executive function happens. Well, they found that there's this window of tolerance that you have, and if you get kicked out of it, you go into hypo arousal or hype or hyper arousal and faculty don't even know this. And so we're doing stuff in the classroom, joking around, being sarcastic or, you know, having fun. And certain students are being triggered by that. And when they get triggered, the unfortunate thing is that when the amygdala kicks in, they go into this bite, flight, freeze and appease and their cortex automatically shuts down because you can't be thinking to, to survive. You have to react. OK, and so they're in this reaction mode. Their cortex is shut down. And you're graded, you know, in terms of outcomes by retention and success of your students. So if you're counteracting how the brain is functioning because of its physiology, then you're at a deficit. So a lot of my work is training faculty in understanding what they do so they can do what they want. You know, so how do you, how do you become embodied in your teaching? Because your embodied teaching is critical because students have mirror neurons and mirror neurons is a neurological thing. It's a reality. It's a real thing. It's been measured. It's been found. And mirror neurons are really important for relations, relationships, for, for connecting with other people. It's for sensing. If you're sensing threat, you can sense feelings of other people. And until faculty can move out of their brain mind way of delivering information, but to a point where they're establishing a relationship and a connection, what I call embodied teaching, you lose that strength of the mirror, mirror neuron connection with these students. And that's what they need to feel safe is that they start to let their hair down. They start to connect. And what's interesting is it's not just faculty. You know, it's the college. So when a student comes to admissions and records, you know, and, and you're helping somebody with the form, you know, and you see the lines really long and the student has a, you know, their face looks flustered or something instead of saying, you know, what's going on, you know, pobrecita or something, you know, like ha, ha, connect with the student. You want to brush them out and get to the next person. Well, they don't get a sense of dignity when that happens. And sometimes they get triggered, you know, so it's in all the relationships in the college. We have to learn to move from a culture of threat to a culture of dignity. So much to unpack there, Diego. This is good stuff. Wow. You know, a lot of my work around transformational change I, I, I centered it and I've written extensively on, on kindness, why kindness is so important, because I, I, I really like what you said about the gravity. And then you have the other forces, centrifugal forces going against you. And I think even educators can get triggered. And as we're going through transformational change, which is could be scary for some, 
if we are not kind to our core, I like dignity too. I think they go hand in hand. Yeah. That that people get triggered, and that's why uh, often change is difficult. Culture change is is difficult. What I want to do is on unpack then for students this gravity, right? Uh, how? What are some strategies, some nuts and bolts strategies, if you don't mind, Diego, sharing uh, of how you help faculty create that that gravity? Well, so there's two things. Um, one is creating psychological safety, and the other one is embodied interactions or embodied teaching. Um, and so in terms of psychological safety, what I tend to do is I focus on inquiry for the student. So how do you create a, a pedagogy where the student is in inquiry or exploration? And so it has to do with a, a number of pieces to it. So for example, during the semester, at the beginning of class, I'll ask a student for students, to re- I'll ask a question at the very beginning for students to think about. And a lot of times they're questions of not only about how you're doing, but about their behavior. You know, were there any classes that you didn't turn in your papers last week? You know, it, or you didn't meet the deadline for the assignment. Why did, why did that happen? You know, what could you do differently? And I find that reflection is a really, really critical thing to help students feel safe because they start to feel like you care. And then you have students share. You know, they can go in, into pairs or they can um, share with a larger group. I like doing pairs or smaller groups because they tend to share more then. So I think reflection is really critical. And reflection is critical also at the end of any lesson that you're doing. I mean, if you want to consolidate learning, you've got to ask them questions about what they just learned so that they're putting into their words the experience. And sometimes the student will share something and another student had the same experience, but they didn't have words for it. Or they didn't even notice that it happened. But when the student says it, they now get it, you know. And so getting the word from their perspective of what they're learning is critical. So Part of what I find to create psychological safety is reflection in the class. So it's a pedagogy of mindfulness. And mindfulness is not just doing meditation type activities or breathing activities, which are critical. I mean, if you look at Daniel Siegel's work and a lot of the work on the prefrontal lobe that they're doing, it's a lot of it's based on mindfulness techniques. They're very effective in rewiring the prefrontal lobes. So I don't, I think that's critical and we do focusing exercises, but I think reflection is also another mindfulness um, capability. One of the early things that I do is I help the students recognize the behaviors that supported them in learning. You know, so I ask them a question, you know, what, what did you have that helped you learn? You know, what were the behaviors of your teacher, the behaviors of other students? You know, what were the types of supplies and resources you had? And have them brainstorm because you got to get this stuff down on paper for them or they're thinking about it and then brainstorm onto the board what they're saying, you know, or on a chart so you can put it up somewhere. So they get all that out. And then I ask, well, what are the behaviors that kept you from learning, you know, of other students and the behavior of teachers, you know, the, be- the resources you didn't have and have them think about that and then brainstorm that. And then you get that out and then you, students start to see, oh, I see when I do this type of thing, that does, that's not going to help, but this really helps. Well, that creates safety in the classroom. And then you can show your syllabus or you can show whatever your rules are because they will tie to what the students have there most likely. I mean, because they're, they're pretty smart. <laughs> students are very smart. I, I found a student that hasn't been. Um, what, what's interesting is that when I first started my pilots and I was doing it with pretty high risk students, you know, students that came from these colorful backgrounds, I was told that, you know, probably 25% of my students are going to have learning disabilities, of which, you know, we've had thousands of students and it's a handful. It's not very many. I mean, there's certain types of learning disabilities, but, you know, like what they were thinking I was going to face, you know, these students are really smart. I mean, I I found students, if you'd create a, a, a pedagogy of inquiry, so they're brainstorming what they think the behaviors are. They get them out rather than you telling them on your syllabus what it is, which you need to do anyway, but have them engaged. I mean, the way that we were having them learn math and statistics was that I taught them how to do research. You know, so my students actually have PhDs and their PhDs are in social injustice. They really understand it because they come from tough neighborhoods and tough lives. And so what they, what I, what we did was, 
I taught them how to do research questions. Well, so what, what was a social justice issue in your life? You know, when were you felt indignity? Where did your community feel indignity? What are the issues? You know, students came up with racism and discrimination and why money goes to the military rather than education, you know, environmental justice, um, STDs, you know, drugs, gangs, you know, all kind, every semester they come up with different ones, you know. And, um, and so I taught, so I put them in their groupings that they decided to go into. And then I taught them how to do research questions because, you know, if you have a, a experiential PhD in a topic, you know a lot about it. You know, you know the subtleties and the insides and out of it. So if you teach them how to do research questions and you help them with it, they can come up with really good research questions. And then from there, I taught them how to do quantitative and qualitative questions that would answer their research questions and develop a survey. And then you have them in teams of five or so go out and survey 150 people. You know, so they're having fun getting out there. Some of them are scared. You know, they're they're more analytical and they don't want to go out, but they're with their buddies. So they're, they're actually doing the work. But hey, the ones that were more analytical helped develop the survey. So they're like they see each other in these different strengths that they have. And then now you've got a data set that has meaning to them. You know, they want to understand this phenomenon that affected their family, their community. And now they want to learn statistics, you know. And so if you look at the work, the work you know, Myra Snell and, and the um, California Acceleration Project, you know, the first kit they put together that, that Tua Rust put together, he put together for our social justice program. So we'd have statistics because Los Medanos College did our program there. And we were doing math acceleration and English acceleration at the same time before acceleration became you know, something to talk about. And, um, and so these students now have a data set, you know, so the inquiry, so get them into inquiry. We've got to move out of filling the pail. You know, we have to get through these topics. We got to give them these things. The key is to give them frameworks and then have them work on projects in teams to work together. But what we found was you had to teach them how to work in teams. That was like absolutely critical. And so we focused on 21st century professional competencies you know, so that they could do inquiry together, that they could develop a, a, a project management plan that they could get to the end of the semester and have a complex project done where five students are contributing to it, you know, and, and laying all that information out. So we had to teach them how to do those types of skills, which became the skill set they needed. And by the way, <clears throat> what we found out later, so we started replicating this. We, so we replicated it at um, Hartnell College in Salinas. Another you know ninety percent Latino community, and um, we brought into the nursing program there. You know they were they were dealing with some retention stuff, so we, so they asked us to bring this one week, twenty first century professional competencies program. It's an, it's an immersion one week, you know, before they start the semester. So they did this, and they found the faculty started talking about the second year clinicals changed dramatically. That that the doctors and the nurses were saying these students are phenomenal. They really know how to work together. They also found that um, that student success and student satisfaction went up. So they had less of those legal issues that come up when students feel like they're not being treated right. Um, that diminished considerably. And then later on, the Joyce Foundation funded us, and they, they gave us funding. And then the RP group did a longitudinal study, six years. So it's a six-year outcome study, not only of academics, but of salaries. And what they found with these nursing students, and they compared the nursing students – because once they, they put that one-week intervention in, that one-week course, the whole program changed over. So from that point on, every nursing student went through that one week. But before that, no students went through it. So they compared the students that went through it to the students that didn't. And they found a huge salary impact, you know, six years later. Um, and it, it's kind of hard to believe, but it was over $40,000 median difference between the students that went through that one week and those that didn't. And talking with the faculty there, the only thing that really changed was that. And so you can have an impact on these students, not only in the class in terms of safety, but by an inquiry-based pedagogy where they learn to work in teams. So you teach them those skills so they're very effective. It changes their career outcomes. And we have the same for salaries for the students in our regular program for students that are underprepared for college. How does this look like at a campus? I, I heard you say immersion. I heard uh, a week immersion. I heard you say that you, you, you train faculty. So what's the ideal program look like? Do a certain cohort of students go through a, a one-week immersion? And then also, whether you teach English or biology, it doesn't matter if, you, uh, particip if you're trained in this, you can fold in these, these aspects into your course. How, how does it look like for a, a college that, that wants to implement this, this program, Diego? There, so there's the 
approach, you know, so how do you create a culture of dignity? And then there's more programmatic parts of it, like this course, this immersion, one week immersion course. Okay, so there's different pieces to it. Um, so the one week immersion requires, uh, we have curriculum kits, we have all these activities laid out, you know, hundreds of activities um, for the faculty to learn and they're sequenced so they can understand how to make it happen. And of course, they can improve on it completely. We, we want them to do that, but they first need to learn how to do this. And one thing we learned, at, you know, the, the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching with their stat way and quant way, especially with their productive persistence, they found the same thing that I found over the years. And that is you have to take faculty through the experience of experiential learning. You have to take them through the experience of these things because what was modeled for them in their PhD programs and their master's programs wasn't this. They were, they, what was modeled for them was cognitive learning. And that's not what our students need. You know, they, they need something deeper. So you have to take the faculty through an experience so they have a barometer and understanding of what, what it is that they're trying to bring across. Now, another aspect to this, and I'm going to go off on a tangent for a second so you know that I know that I'm going off on a tangent, is that part of the culture that we're in in higher education, especially in graduate school, you know, getting a master's and a PhD, it's a culture of subjugation, you know, that, that you have to jump through these hoops and you're being, the wheat from the chaff is being separated. And, you know, where I went to graduate school, they cold called you. I mean, all this horrible stuff, you know. And what happens is we get trained in that environment. We come to community college thinking, oh, we can do that with our students. And lo and behold, it doesn't work. You know, they leave because they have very sensitive stress response systems. Also, punitive discipline doesn't work for them. You have to develop empathic discipline. And there's work that um, Jason Okono Afui at at, um, Stanford has done that shows if you do use empathic discipline in one class with students, it actually inoculates them for the other classes where they may be doing punitive discipline. So there's a healing thing that you can do as faculty. So one of the core things is how do you learn to be different? How do you learn the skills and the techniques to become embodied to listen differently, to interact differently, to have these types of connections. And so what we do, so there's several levels of training we do. One, so I'm working with a a, a 60,000 student college right now, and I've been training their staff, faculty, and administrators on how to listen at this deeper level. Um, Because, you know, when you have a deep conversation with somebody, you, you feel it. You know, you have people walk away changed, and they walk away having their heart connected and some feeling inside of them. Well, how do you have those conversations and how do you develop that? And so we take them through four types of conversations, two based on the amygdala, you know, so fight, flight, freeze, and appease, and two based on another way of listening so that they can start to experience themselves this different way of listening. We do it in pairs. But what happened is that the executive vice chancellor who's responsible for this team, and she handles like eight teams right now, she said, I said, how did how did that workshop work for your team? Because it's six months later. And she goes, that team is a dream. I mean, they really know how to work together. These other teams are fighting. There's all kinds of problems. And then I said, yeah, if you learn to listen, because you don't learn this in graduate school. A lot of us don't even learn it in our families. And we just don't learn these types of things. So you have to go fundamentally, how do we start to shift the culture of the colleges by the behaviors? And effective organizations have good relationships. Quality of relationships is a barometer or a thermometer of how well an organization will do. So what what we do is we we work with teams to help them work effectively because you've got to change the college culture, not just the faculty. And then we work with faculty because with faculty, I have all kinds of activities we do. And we teach them the pedagogy of inquiry. We teach um, how do you set up the container so the students feel safe, you know, and that has to do with some of the things I talked about. It's having to get the right behaviors in the class, getting the right introductions done in the class, both the faculty and the students. How do you create an environment where you're vulnerable, but you're not doing therapy? You're just, you're being connected with someone because you're sharing at a deeper level. That creates the ability for other students to feel, oh, that's modeled for me. You know, and so there's there's all these different techniques that we have and, and curriculum that faculty can take in their classes. So, for example, and Craig Hayward, I don't know if you know Craig at all, but he's uh, he worked in the RP group. He's done a lot of research and he studied. Actually, he and um, and, uh, and a colleague, um, Willits, um, did the study on the California Acceleration Project, you know, the initial one. 
And he also studied my trainings, you know, our, our faculty experiential learning institute. And he found that two years or three years later, that um, faculty in all all the disciplines, we had faculty from computer science and math to physics and chemistry and biology to English to history to um, philosophy, you know, just art teachers, um, teachers that taught nursing, taught um, radiologic technology. I mean, we have all kinds of faculty come into the training that their success rates, when they compared their success rates before they had that training to afterwards, looking at it longitudinally, was statistically significant in terms of the retention rates and the success rates. And, and Craig's hypothesis was that the marginalized students, the students that are on the edge of your class, like you're, you're teaching to the core of your class, but there are students that are on the edge. His hypothesis was that the, the way that we taught them to connect with students and create that safe environment was that they actually captured those students that were on the margins, okay? And that that's what changed their, um, the statistically, their outcomes in terms of student success. So we work with faculty and we give them specific types of things they can do in their curriculum, and, but we model it. So we have them go through the experience of it. And then the third way we do it is we have this one-week immersion and I'm working right now with, um, I don't know if you know Rob Johnstone. Well, you know Rob Johnstone. So um, he's working with the Aspen Institute, NCII, his organization. And, and we have a project with Bank of America Foundation where they've funded a million dollars to 21 colleges, 11 community colleges, five historically black colleges, and five his, four-year Hispanic serving institutions. And so I'm on the team working in that environment, you know, and um, with the different colleges and, um, and I'm doing a webinar on how do you teach 21st century professional competencies and meet the needs of marginalized students and, and students of color, because this is a jobs program for students of color. How do you, so we have this one week immersion and it's one week, we've trained faculty to do it in many different places to do it, but that's the one that has huge salary impact six years later or change as well as changing like the clinicals in the second year and the students, they, they learn the stuff and start using it in class immediately. They start using it in their lives with their families. And, um, and that's like very dense learning, you know, very deep and dense learning. Um, so those are the ways that we work. We work with teams on the, on the, on the campus to change the culture, work with faculty so they can bring curriculum and that in the community college, we call curriculum, you know, these outlines. This is not curriculum. This is activities, you know, detailed activities on how to do this kind of thing. And then we have a one-week immersion where you put these activities together to create an environment where they learn these 21st century professional competencies that then will take them for the rest of their lives into careers where you know, their leadership skills, collaborative leadership skills is primarily what we teach. So I hope I answered your question. I, I might have missed a piece of that. No, no, thank you. When I learned about your work, that's why I was excited to invite you to be part of the, the podcast because I know you're a little bit familiar with my work. I've helped colleges plan and implement a variety of what I like to call homegrown practices because, as you know, there's no such thing as a best practice. Right. Uh, a best practice at one particular college may not translate to another, so I try to, my best to help them plan and implement through coaching and through kindness, change. When I when I learned about your work, because so many colleges are struggling with, um, and I know you're familiar with Guided Pathways, it's got this fourth pillar in sure learning. Boy, I tell you, your, your work just fits in there so nicely. I do a lot of work there, but you know what? The world's a big place, and I just I want people to know about you and your and your and your great work there. I I love. Uh, student stories. And I know that everywhere from the Community College Research Center to the RP group, I love the RP group, by the way, I've, I've collaborated with them a lot there. Um, I love that organization and, and their people. And yes, I know, I know Craig, uh, a uh, really cool guy. We, we, we see the evidence in your work. It's been uh, re uh, researched. Can you uh, share a, a story or two of, of students who, who went through this, who experienced this and what they've told you, how, how it's changed their lives? Sure. Um, I could show you some very short videos, too. Um, so there's this one student, I'll call her Anna. And so Anna, in my first semester, I was out recruiting for the second semester. And this is back in the fall of 2003. And I would recruit at the adult school because I found the adult school was like a really great place because students that have a strength and persistent survival are there. You know, they're trying to make, make, make it, you know, get a GED. And so I was, 
I was giving a talk in this one class about our program, and there was a teacher there, and she said, you need to talk to this student that I'm calling Anna. So I invited Anna to come to Cabrillo and, and have, and I was going to, to this orientation of where I was going to talk about the program. And so then, so the next week she comes and she brings Imelda with her, a friend of hers, because she was afraid to come by herself. I do the talk and stuff. And I, so I went up, she came up to me afterwards and I said, you know, what do you think? She goes, I, I can't be in this program. And I said, why? She goes, well, you know, when I was 13 years old, usually when I'm asking students questions, it usually goes back to 13 or eight years old or something. When I was 13 years old, so the second one will be about the student that has 13 year old thing too. Um, he, that she, she crossed the border with her sister and her mother in Arizona when she was 13. And it was an older sister and they made it across the border and they ended up in Southern California and she was living in Southern California. And, um, and, and after a year they felt the migra was, was getting close, which is the immigration control. You know, they call it ice now. Um, and so they moved to Watsonville and so she ends up in Watsonville and she graduates from eighth grade and they have, you know, celebration of graduate from eighth grade first person in her family ever graduated from eighth grade her older sister never graduated from eighth grade and her mother so then they have her quinceanera and she turns 15 as a quinceanera and in her quinceanera she figures out sometime around that that she's pregnant so she drops out of school at the in ninth grade um before she goes to high school and by the time i meet her she's 26 she's been working two jobs for all those years had four children and she said, Diego, after telling me this story, Diego, how can I go to Cabrillo College? I never went to high school. Luckily, I was in, my, in the middle or towards the end of my first semester, and I had seen what it was happening to these students in the classroom when you create an environment you know, that's psychologically safe and, and a culture of dignity and they, a sense of belonging. They can do all kinds of things. You know, I said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, I've got these, others, these students. You'll do fine. So she, she comes the next semester, brings her friend. Um, they both go in the program and, um, it turns out, you know, people go, she was on the honor roll until she did all her prereqs for the nursing program and then went into the nursing program. So, you know, prereqs for nursing are pretty tough stuff, science, you know, and we're only a one semester intervention, <laughs> you know, so people would say, oh, of course you'd be on the Dean's list in your program. Well, actually she was on the Dean's list throughout her <laughs> her time doing the prereqs to go to the nursing program and then graduated from the nursing program. So that's a story of a student that never went to high school. So whenever I hear you need a GED or a high school diploma, it's like, oh, give me a break. You know, if they're 18 years old, they're thinking they've got enough experience in their life. You just need a pedagogy of inquiry and experience so that they can bring all the knowledge they have into the classroom and apply it. You know, so there's a relevance to the education. You, you contextualize your pedagogy for what's going on in their lives, their families, work life, and what's going on in their, in their neighborhood. How do you tie your curriculum? That's the work we have to do as faculty is make it relevant to what they're experiencing in their lives rather than sticking to our discipline, you know, and look facing our discipline and really being oriented towards that in all of our workshops. We need to be facing what's going on in our students' lives and how do we contextualize our work. So that was one story. I don't know if you want the second one. It'll be shorter. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. So the second story was during, it was my first pilot, um, the group that, um, where the guy got sliced. And um, so one of the things we did after lunch was to build robots out of Legos. Now, you know, they're not kids, so why would you build robots out of Legos? Well, I came from the high-tech industry, and, and the last company I had, we built um, uh, what's called embedded systems. So it's embedded software. And embedded software is a, is a field that you can make a lot of money in. It, you can have a career in it. So one thing I wanted was to have some kind of activity that would keep the students awake after lunch because, you know, you get the, the food coma. You know, so they, they were working with their hands, building Legos. And so the first three days, they build a robot. And then they, in the, on that third day, they put the motors in it and the sensors in it. And then they have to program it. So they spend the next two days programming it and then getting the bugs out of the program, and then they demonstrated on Friday. So that's what they did with that, just that two-hour part. It was We did a whole thing with them that during that time, but just the two hours after lunch. So this student 
comes in. He misses the first two days, and he comes in on Wednesday. He builds the robot, puts the sensors and motors in, and he starts programming it. And he's showing me. He's like, look at Diego. And I'm going, oh, man, this, this, this one has aptitude. He's going to be amazing in computer science. So after class, you know, I'm leaving and I'm walking down the stairs because I was up on the second floor. And he's sitting down. There's a, there's a job fair. This is outside stairs. And there's a job fair going on. And um, he's sitting on the stairway filling out an application for Safeway or something like that for a job. And I, I sit down next to him. And I said, how are you doing? He goes, fine. I said, what do you think of today? He says, oh, I really enjoyed it. I said, yeah, you've, you've got an aptitude here. You know, you, sh- you may be really great in our computer science program. It would be wonderful to have you in it. He goes, oh, Diego, I can't, I can't be in the computer science program. I, I can't go to college. And I said, so then I noticed his wife was standing in front of him, and she was holding their child, and there was a stroller down below and I go oh, okay he's got to get a job and he has to work and of course that's going to be the difficult you know that's a triple force thing well he turns to me he goes Diego I can't go to college because you know when I was in second grade so it always goes back to this kind of age when I was in second grade my teacher told me that I had dyslexia I can't you know I've got dyslexia and I said have you ever been tested for it he goes no and then, you know, mind you, I never, I wasn't a teacher, you know, I hadn't been teaching, you know, I just was doing these pilots. So I had, I had this paragraph, you know, a piece of paper, I handed it to him and said, could you read this to me? He read the paragraph to me and I, and, you know, that's not a test or anything, but I thought, hmm, I realized he didn't know who he was. You know, he was told he was something and he was actually something else. And what I've found over time is that you have to create an environment where they really figure out who they are. And the way to do that is by creating a culture of dignity where there's kindness, there's compassion, there's room and celebration for mistakes because you can't learn without making mistakes. I mean, I don't know how many of you, when you were born, walked out of the room you were born in. I mean, I have scars on my face from hitting tables and stuff, learning to walk. And when you are learning, you make mistakes. And what I loved about the high tech industry is that innovation is is based on making mistakes. Our philosophy is make mistakes as fast as you can, but don't make the same mistake twice. Okay, that's innovation. And so how do we create an environment where the students embrace making mistakes, that they'll raise their hand and take the risk of saying, giving an answer maybe, and it might be wrong, where before in their life, other students would laugh at them if they made the wrong mistake, or the teacher would kind of snicker, wouldn't call on them in the future because they didn't want to embarrass them. You know, all this shaming that happens, which I see as educational trauma, for those of you that are aware of the ACES survey, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey developed by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and Kaiser Permanente to look at childhood experiences and its effect on long-term diseases like heart disease and diabetes and others. And they found a direct correlation towards these 10 experiences they looked at. Well, they didn't have in their ACEs survey a question about educational trauma. And I think what's happening is our students are coming to our classroom, they're being triggered into educational trauma, and the amygdala kicks in, and they, their cortex is turned off. And so they can't learn. They don't feel safe enough. And so what I find, and I, I help faculty start to understand, is that you may be kidding or may intervene with one student, thinking, oh, I'm just impacting that student because they're not doing something right. But you know what? All those students that have those sensitive stress response systems, they're watching because they're hypervigilant. And they're watching to see what you're doing to other students because you don't have to do it to them, but you do it to somebody else and they know this is not a safe environment. And so what I want us all to know is that you can do what you want, but you have to know what you do. So in my latest workshop I did last week with faculty at at a college here in, in the Salinas Valley, was I've been working with this racial justice group, um, national group, and uh, it's a people of colors group that I'm involved in. And we started developing this process because how do you help people understand their implicit biases and understand their um, microaggressions? And we're finding in our people of color group that we're having microaggressions happen there. You know, so people are getting triggered in those groups and you'd think everything is fine, but it's not. So it's it's a bigger problem. And, And then you have issues of gender fluidity, you know, and, and there's some people that will do microaggressions against that. You have issues around, um, you know, same-sex marriage. You know, so there's all kinds of areas where people can have biases. 
So what we did is we d- we're developing this process called the ouch process. So if you can create a safe environment and you want to learn, so well, I teach about learning, the learning ladder is like you go from arrogance, like you know everything, to insight, you know, and that step from arrogance to insight is a big step. So if you want to learn about biases, your own biases, your own microaggressions, I'm going to give you this exercise. So in your classroom and in this workshop I did, the counseling director at the college said, I'm going to use this with my staff meetings. Um, but what you do is this. If you create a safe environment, I mean, that's really the key, is that you say, okay, if I do anything that triggers your fight, flight, freeze, or appease, if you get triggered, you go out of your window of tolerance, I want you to say, ouch. And you have to say it loud enough so I can hear it, Okay. We're not going to process it. We're not going to talk about it or anything, but I know something happened. And then I can inquire and try to figure out what happened. Okay. I can start thinking about "Mm, something just happened. What did I just do? You know, at least will give me a feedback loop. Something happened. Um, Or if somebody says something and they go, they catch it, you know, oh shit, I just did microaggression. They go, they go, oops. You know, so if you hear oops, you go, oh, somebody just said, they just created a microaggression or some bias or something. Um, or if somebody witnesses one, you go, whoa, you know, and so what you now has have a language to see what's not being talked about, you know, and what's not being experienced. So if you're brave enough, and this is the kind of professional development work I do, is to help create the environments so we can start to learn these things. This ouch, oops, whoa. I mean, that's, those are just simple words. They're just, they're just one syllable. It's pretty simple, but there's a whole lot to unpack in there. Um, and so we're, we're creating this process now called safe space to brave space. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that poem on brave space, a beautiful poem of how do you create the space so we can start to uncover these things that are actually happening so that, because one of the things I'm learning, you know, with all my years with people of color in my life is that people of color lives li- live lives that are very uncomfortable. You go in a store and somebody's following you, you know, the police pull you over and something's going to happen. You know, it's, it's uncomfortable. You're interacting with people of different you know, the dominant culture and something's going to not feel good and you have to watch what you're doing. So you're uncomfortable all the time. But when I'm in other environments that are dominant culture environments, everybody wants it to be safe because they don't want to be uncomfortable. You know, and so why is it that we have environments that are safe for those, but everybody else is uncomfortable that have this other thing? So we all have to become uncomfortable because learning is by making mistakes. So what we're doing is we're saying, how do you move from a safe space to a brave space? And the ouch process is part of the creating the the brave space. We're letting people know something just happened. We got to look at what's happening here. But then when something happens, we can't go into the amygdala response. We can't go into fight, flight, freeze and appease and start disagreeing and arguing. Go to the cognitive level, which we've learned very well in graduate school. We teach critical thinking, how to argue. You don't go there. You have to go to a deeper space, a connected space. And so this third step is how do you create that connected space? How do you create that space where healing happens, where repair happens, where you have the hurt is addressed? You know, that learning takes place. But the learning we're talking about here is the learning of how to create a culture of dignity. And it's not by reading a book. You can read a lot of books. Books are going to give you cognitive learning. This is experiential learning. It takes you to a deeper level, which will actually affect your whole life, not just where you're learning it. And so that's what the beauty of this type of learning is. And that's what is kind of professional development, the kind of work we do with students, activities. And and students come alive. We all come alive when we start to learn in this way because we reality that we know and we feel and we experience becomes known. It's not hidden in me and that I'm festering and getting pissed off by what's happening. I want to go back to your hitchhiking because when you think about hitchhiking, you have a destination and you're really relying on the kindness of people and your desti- to help you to your destination. I don't know what it was about the 70s, but you can do that relatively safely. Maybe over time, the sociopaths learned the pattern and that's why it ruined it for everybody. But my point is, students in many ways, they kind of hitchhike through through college. They already come with the trauma that you, you explained. And our work really is to make sure that we don't contribute to that trauma as they, quote unquote, hitchhike through, through the institution. And so that culture... Of, of dignity is is really key. And I, I want to thank you so much for unpacking that 
I really appreciate it. Can't begin to tell you how grateful I am for all your wonderful work and what and, and all of the just a positive impact you you made on students and, and people. You know, you went to an Ivy and I was like I was lucky I went to community college, I ended up at an Ivy too. But we, we kind of have things backwards in society. We we put these Ivies in these high pedestals because they actually they accept the least amount of students, but yet community colleges accept the most. We accept everything from students with disabilities to veterans with all sorts of issues, foster youth, students of color, you name it. And and as I told so many people, it's actually a privilege to teach these people, just an absolute privilege that we have. Yeah. Uh, but we can get better. We can get better. And I think the work that you do and so many other others that I've collaborated with is that there's good news, right, Diego, that there, there is good news, that there is a way to help these students and ourselves. We just got, got to be willing to be learners ourselves, right? That, that's the key. That's the key. And, and yeah, and, and you, you were saying, you know, one of our goals is to, to take students, so they're hitchhiking through college. They don't have these types of, of bad experiences. And the thing that I'm seeing is the goal is that a window of tolerance that's when you go out of learning, you know, you go into hypo um, reaction or, or hyper reaction that the window of tolerance is, is it shrinks and it gets larger. More trauma you have, the more it shrinks. OK. And I think what the goal is for us in community college is to create an environment and a culture and pedagogy that allows the window of tolerance to increase so that they have more and more bandwidth in the window of tolerance. And that means that we need a pedagogy that's trauma informed that has activities that allow for that depth to occur in all the courses that we teach in. It's not just in some counseling course. It's in all the courses because teachers can, in, in, they can bring these activities into their classes in this way of thinking and changing their, their pedagogy. I've worked with the science college at, at um, Cal State University East Bay and teaching the science faculty how to do this. Um, the other thing is we've been doing this online. We're very effective in creating online environments where students have these experiences as well. And so we've had 60,000 students go through that one week immersion course today. We've now turned it into an online course. Um, and, you know, the key to my work is that I've gone to some special colleges after Pasadena City College. And what I realized from going to these special colleges and the way they did pedagogy was that why couldn't we do that at Pasadena City College? You know, Pasadena City College was great, but it was very industrialized. And what I'm finding is that for us to do the pedagogy that a lot of students that come from privileged backgrounds get, we need to change somewhat to create the context for our students to grow in that, in their, that deeper part of themselves. And we need to move from the industrial model, you know, and, and to really open up to providing these experiences for students, you know, project-based, experiential inquiry-based approaches and um, give them a framework and then now work the framework and let give them the degrees of freedom. I think we've taken um, scaffolding to the nth degree, trying to make it so easy to learn something that we, we stop the learning and that we have to give the degrees of freedom in the scaffolding so that students can make mistakes because they need to do that to learn. So how do we put that in place? And I think those are pedagogical questions, you know, teaching in the classroom for 16 years, learned a lot. I um, learned a lot from my students and my faculty. I've had some of the greatest faculty that I've worked with over the years at Cabrillo. It was wonderful faculty. So um, I feel privileged to be here with you and, and to have time to talk about this. Thank you, Diego. The devil is and forever will be in the details. And so it's, it's wonderful that there's a resource in you and for uh, colleges to seek and be able to learn, well, how, how do you actually do this? Well, as you know, I'm an implementer. I'm all about, it's all about the implementation. It's yeah. nice to have discussions. It's nice to get our why, but at some point we just got to do the work. And so thank you for having a framework for tools and resources and the kind of PD that, that you provide. I want to thank you so much for participating in the Student Success podcast and wish you nothing but the best in your continued metaphorical hitchhiking, Diego. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I wish you the best in this podcast universe that you're in now. And I, it's really wonderful all the work that you've been doing too, Al, over the years. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Podcast. 
Each episode has show notes, which include helpful links and necessary follow-up information to help you get results. Please consider subscribing to the Continuous Learning Institute website. There are no advertisements. It simply updates about articles, tools, resources, podcasts, etc., all tailored for you, the practitioner. Thank you.